Okay, and my setting to begin with is going to be a probability measure preserving dynamical system. I'll try to not erase this part of the board. I'll add some notation as I, and maybe some assumptions as I go along. If I get confused and I start wiping, please let me know. Okay, um, so now I set the word recurrence. So it would amount almost to mathematical blasphemy if I didn't state the Poincare recurrence theorem. So we actually saw it earlier this week in Partner's talk. I think I'm going to state it in a slightly different version. So the Poincare recurrence theorem says that if I have a set in my sigma algebra B and the measure of A is positive, then I know that the measure on the set of points x and x for which t and x is in A infinitely often has measure 1. And just to make sure, here infinitely often means for infinitely many n. Okay. So this is a very nice theorem. Um, maybe let's look at a picture of what it says. So if we imagine this to be our dynamical system X, and we have somewhere in our system a set A of positive measure, then the theorem says that aside from maybe a few stupid points that I have to ignore that form a set of measure zero, I can start anywhere I want in my system, any X, and then I am guaranteed that when I travel along the orbit, tx, t squared x, and so on, I will hit my set A again and again and again, infinitely many times. I thought for this, you don't need a got it yet, right? You have to do A. Hmm? You have to look at the measure of the A. That's a different version, I think. Okay, I'll... Yes, okay, that's, that's a problem. Then I will already now assume uh, up here that we are... Okay. Um, all right. So this is a very nice statement. And, um, and so it tells us a lot about these orbits, but so since it holds for, in such a general setting, for almost a point, it's natural to ask whether we could potentially prove something better, um, a strong property. So that's where shrinking target problems come into play. And when we look at shrinking target problems, which is also sometimes known as quantitative recurrence uh, problems, we're studying this set that I'm going to denote AIO, which is shorthand for AIO of Bm, which reminds me, I want to introduce this notation that I'm going to stick to throughout. So I'm going to consider sequences of sets Bm. So they're going to be in my sigma algebra. Um, and I'm going to assume that the measure of the Bm's goes to zero. And I'm also going to assume that the set Bm contains the next one, Bm plus one. So you can work without this assumption, but for the purpose of this talk, it's easier not to distinguish all the time, so I'm just going to assume it throughout. Okay, so then we consider this set of points, x in x, for which t and x is in bn infinitely often. Okay? And then I'm going to ask the same questions as for Poincaré recurrence, Namely, what is the measure of the set? And also, in some cases, it's relevant to ask the question, what's the dimension of the set? This is, of course, uh, or this is, this I mean, a fractal dimension. This is relevant when it turns out that the measure is zero. It might still be relevant to check whether the set has positive fractal dimension of some kind. Okay, so 
what does this look like in a picture? Well, the picture looks somewhat the same. We still have our space x. But now instead of a fixed set, we have a sequence of sets that are all contained in each other, and they get smaller and smaller. So these are my BMs. And then I want to find out as well whether when I start at a point x, and I start jumping along the orbit under t, will I hit these targets infinitely many times? Okay, but it's obviously a very much harder condition to satisfy because when I go off somewhere here and I come back, the target that I need to hit has now gotten much smaller. Okay? But so this question we can say quite a lot about, actually, already, just by applying the classical borel cantelli lemma. Okay? So, Borel-Cantelli. Um, so if we restate it sort of in a dynamical language, it tells us the following. So the first one is always the same. It tells us this if the sum of the measures of the BMs is convergent, then we always get measure zero. And the converse statement is not exactly as clean. So it says that if the sum of the measures diverges, we need to add the assumption that the sets t minus n of bn forms an independent independent sequence of sets. And if that's the case, then we get measure equal to 1. OK, but this is not so good because this condition is essentially never satisfied for dynamical systems. So, I mean, you can construct such a sequence that dependent, but if you want to prove something like this for a general family of shrinking targets, then you're never going to have this property. So there's a natural question that arises, and we've already seen it a couple of times this week, is this question of whether we can replace independence with mixing. If we understand mixing as a kind of asymptotic independence property, can we then get this statement? Okay, so the question is um, if we can replace independence with mixing of some kind. Okay? Unfortunately, the answer is that it's not true in general. So even with your most wonderfully mixing system in the world, it's possible always to construct such a sequence of targets which has divergent sum of measures, but where we don't get measure of infinity often hits being equal to one. So we can't say this in general, um, not in general. But the next question that comes up, question two, is can we get question one um, for a large family of sequences BM? Okay, so this could, for example, be, and it's often the case, that we look at something like all balls with fixed center. And now I set the word balls, which means that I should add an assumption up here also that I'm generally now, from now on, working in a metric space. Okay, and here the answer fortunately turns out to often be yes. If we put a little bit of restriction on how the targets are allowed to look, then we can get some statements. And if we get such a statement, then we say that we have a dynamical borel cantelli lemma. OK. So this is sort of really the, the basic, the standard classic question in shrinking target problems. Um, 
And it's kind of clear that these type of questions have a lot of variations, and a lot of people are looking at these variations, so it's a very vast literature. Um, there's a couple of good papers to look at. So there's a 2001 paper by Chernoff and Kleinbock, which has a nice introduction, giving some of the terminology and definitions and basic results. And a 2009 survey by Jayadev Athreya, which focuses more on homogeneous dynamics, but also gives some um, general results. OK, so this is the, the classic version of. What about that? Uh, I mean, you can study these questions also. Like, so say you take the modular surface, right? You can take shrinking cusps. So that's, that's in shrinking neighborhoods of infinity. Right? And they would be non compact. You mean by the peak center, the core constraint, No, I mean, you, you, can get, you can definitely get, I mean, you have dynamical Borel Cantelli lemmas for, for example, cusp excursions of geodesics. So I'm not assuming compact here. I mean, this is just an example of what could be a, uh, but yeah, you, and you could even interpret this fixed center here as uh, infinity in, in some cases. Um, Okay, yes, so this was the classic shrinking target uh, problem. Um, but so now there's a, a new kid on the block um, in shrinking target town, and that's the set of eventually always hitting points. Let me write that over here. So I'm going to abbreviate that E A. H. Okay, and eventually always hitting is an attempt to impose some regularity in this shrinking target problem on how long we're supposed to wait between hits. Okay, so in the classical shrinking target property, we can have a hit and this orbit can go around and spend a long time somewhere else and only come back much later, do one hit, and then it can go off again for a long, long time. We want to study a situation impose some regularity on how long it's allowed to stay away. So the definition is as follows. We say that a point X is eventually always hitting for the target's BM under T if there exists an M0 of X large uh, zero of x, which is a natural number, such that the orbit x, t, x, <coughs> and so on up to t, m minus 1, x, so the first m orbit points intersected with the latest target, is non-empty. And that has to be true for all m larger than or equal to m0. We're going to denote this set by E A H, which is going to be shorthand for E A H of B M. Okay. So, what does this look like in a picture? So let's say again we have our dynamical system. We have our shrinking targets over here. So first of all, this that there's only supposed to exist an M zero says that. The orbit is, is allowed to do whatever it wants for, for in the beginning. But from some point onwards, it has to grow up, so to say, and start behaving nicely. By which we mean that from this point m0 onwards, so if this is by the time we get to tm0 of x, so we have been around doing other stuff. Here. So then let's say that in the next iteration we hit in here, we hit all 100, but not 101, okay? So this orbit sort of hit the target very well. Well, actually, I should say, I should probably say M0 plus 100. But anyways, the point is that now this orbit can, for the next 97 iterations, do whatever it wants, 
but before it gets to the hundredth iteration after M0, it will have had to return and do perform a better hit, so hit a smaller target, okay? Whereas if we imagine that we, in the next hit, only hit a little bit inside our latest target, then we would have to return again very quickly, okay? So it imposes some regularity on how long you're allowed to be away, proportional to how well you did last time you hit the target, so to say, okay? Okay, and the question we want to ask about this set are exactly the same as before, namely what is the measure of the eventually always hitting points and also, if relevant, the dimension of the set. There's a couple of basic observations. Sorry? Ah, so I'm just generally going to write this a shorthand notation um, on the sequence. Ah, this is, okay, yeah, I should say that. So that's the set of point, uh, eventually always hitting points. Okay, so it's all points that satisfy this definition. Okay, um, so this is what we want to do, but before we start really doing this, uh, that, there's a couple of observations we can make about this set. So, yes. 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 What's an example of well, that is exactly an, an example. That's an example. That's an example. And actually, uh, I'm actually going to get back to exactly that example in a bit. Um, okay. Um, but the first observation I want to make is just that how we can write this set. Okay. So we can write this set as a union intersection union. So union from n equal 1 up to infinity, intersection m equal n infinity, union k equal 0 up to m minus 1, t to the minus k bm, right? So we see the first union we get from this, just the existence of such an m0, the intersection we get because it needs to be for all m larger than this m0, and the last union we get from that only we need one of these guys to be in BM, okay? So we can write this set like this, and it prompts me to introduce some more notation that's gonna be used in a bit. I'm gonna define a n as this intersection of CM, m equal to n up to infinity, CM being the union k equals zero up to m minus one, and that means that we can write EAH as the union of ANs. I mean, this is all just rewriting, but it's going to be convenient. And we may observe that the ANs form a upward nested sequence, okay? There's something missing, thank you. T to the minus K, okay. Okay, thank you. The second observation that I want to make is that if we take the eventually always hitting points and we remove a set lambda, which is a set of measure zero, then we are a subset of the points that hit infinitely many times. Okay, and this set lambda is defined as the union 
uh, for k equals zero up to infinity, all the pre-images of the intersection of our targets. Okay, so the reason for this is imagine that we actually take the example where our targets are balls with a fixed center. So if we intersect all of them, what's left is just the center. So if we go back to the, maybe let me draw a new picture. So if this shrinks to a picture and we take all the pre-images of this picture, why do we need to remove that? Let's argue that first. Well, the point is kind of obvious. If we, at some point, write in bull's eye, then we will have that we have an orbit point in BM for all subsequent BMs, right? We will always have that this intersection is empty, so this point will be eventually always hitting. But after it hits here, it can go over here and hang around here for the rest of its life, meaning obviously it doesn't hit infinitely many times. So we certainly need to remove this set, but it's not really an issue because we know that the measure of the BMs goes to zero, so the intersection certainly goes to zero. And then we take countably many pre-images of a zero set. So mu lambda is zero. So without this set, we have a, a subset. And the reason is that if we say we don't hit here in the middle, so the eventually always hitting prop, we will at some point have a hit. Right? So we have one hit. That's good. Then since it's not the middle, we know that as the targets shrink, eventually this will fall out of the latest target. But eventually always hitting says that there is a non-empty intersection, so we will have a later hit, right? And essentially that way, inductively, we can construct an infinite sequence of hits as long as we're not in this lambda set. Okay, so that's the second observation, is that we're essentially a subset, so being eventually always hitting is, in that sense, a stronger property than hitting infinitely off. And uh, there's a third observation that I want to make. Um, and that is that the set of eventually always hitting points is almost T invariant, by which I mean that the measure of eventually always hitting points, and we take the symmetric set difference with its pre-image, and we measure zero. Okay? This requires a small proof, but it's really five lines. Um, and this has a small corollary that if T is ergodic, then the measure of eventually always hitting is zero or one. So this is actually, some people use this as the definition of being ergodic. Um, and instead of saying that invariant sets have measure zero, one, it's equivalent to saying that sets with this property always have measure zero, one, okay? It's equivalent definitions. Okay, so these are sort of three things that tells us a bit about this set. So let me talk a little bit about where this concept came from. So it has a history, but it's a very short history. So the first appearance that I'm aware of in literature was a paper in 2016 by Bujo and Liao. And they were studying beta transformations, so maps of the uh, type beta times x mod 1 where beta is greater than or equal to two. But so they were actually, they didn't call it eventually always hitting and they weren't really thinking of uh, shrinking target problems. They were interested in uh, Diophantine approximation properties of these beta transformations. And so um, if you reformulate sort of their language into notation that I'm introduced here, what they were actually studying was eventually always hitting for this transformation 
to the targets which were intervals with fixed left endpoint zero and beta to the minus s times m at the right endpoint. So these are obviously exponentially shrinking exponentially fast. That means that the sum of the measures is going to be finite. So in particular, we have measure zero for infinitely many hits. So we also have measure zero for eventually always hitting. But they were interested in the Hausdorff dimension of this thing, which they proved was 1 minus s divided by 1 plus s squared as long as s is 0, 1. And for s greater than 1, they have Hausdorff dimension 0. OK. Um, then shortly after, and seemingly unaware of the work of Bijou and Liao, Uh, no, any number like greater than or equal to 2. Yeah. So, 2017, Dubi Kelmer uh, coined the term, eventually always hitting, in a paper. And he was interested exactly in discrete time flows uh, for or on hyperbolic manifolds. So this is exactly the example that, that you were essentially giving. Um, and he has results. Uh, so what he was interested in was establishing sufficient and necessary conditions for the set of eventually always hitting points to be of measure 0 and 1. And he does that in, in this setting. And he has two two results that I want to mention. So one actually applies um, in a very general setting. It's actually just an ergodic uh, measure preserving system. He proved the following. So if the measure of the BMs is less than a constant divided by M for some constant less than 1, then we get measure 0. And then he established a condition in this specific setting. For eventually always hitting to have measure 1. And the condition says if the sum 1 over 2 to the power j, mu b 2 to the power j, is convergent, then we have full measure measure equal to 1. Okay, so we're somehow still here quite far from having like uh, th this <coughs> nice dichotomy that you have for sets that hit, points that hit infinitely. Sorry? What? what it is in this paper. He gets it also for, for example, unipotent flow, I think. And I mean, so it's defined through a group act. So he has a, like one parameter subgroup. Uh, to be honest, I don't remember the, the assumptions. So, so this has quite some assumptions attached to it. This is very general. This, I'm actually, if I have time, I'll prove it. it. Okay. Okay, um, so after the Kelmer paper, there were a bunch of, there were at least three papers that I'm aware of that dealt with this topic. So there was one by Kelmer and you. So that was for flows on homogeneous spaces. Then there was one by uh, Kleinbock. And Wadley, they studied this in the context of uh, inhomogeneous Diophantine approximations. And there was one by uh, Keo and Kelma studying this for 
um, geodesic geodesic flow, well, I'll just say it, geodesic flow on geometrically finite uh, hyperbolic manifolds. And then there's one more result that I want to mention, so it's not out yet, but it's in preparation. And so this is uh, Kleinbock Constantulas and Richter. And so what they did, which is sort of interesting here, is um, so remember in the classical Borel Cantelli lemma, we had this independence assumption. So they tried to say, okay, let's construct of independent targets and then see what we get. So because, I mean, it's not clear what we're supposed to expect for this set of eventually always hitting points, whether there is a sharp dichotomy or if the picture is more messy. And what they showed is that if the targets measure less than or equal to log, log m divided by m, then we get measure zero. And if there exists a constant greater than one, such that the targets have measure greater than or equal to this constant times log, log m, then we get measure one. Okay, so this gives us an idea of what the potential best case scenario that we could expect. And even in this case, we don't get a perfectly sharp dichotomy because we have this constant that we, that we have to deal with. Uh, I think, I don't know, it's something you construct artificially. I don't know exactly, but like if you, I think for, uh, I'm not sure actually how you do it. Well, I think you can always construct, uh, basically, I mean, if you, I think you can do it abstractly, right? To just always make sure that the overlap exactly corresponds to the product of the measures. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see. So this brings me to the third part, finally, of my title. I think so. So. We have been looking at this for one-dimensional systems, so by that I mean typically interval maps of different kinds. Uh, one of the reasons for that is essentially we didn't really understand uh, the setting of Kelma very well, and we also didn't understand what this eventually always hitting uh, set was. So we thought, okay, let's look at some more concrete examples where you have a very simple geometry, and then you, have, you can really make concrete pictures of what's going on and get an idea and a feeling for how this set behaves. Um, so the, the statement I'm gonna, the theorem I'm gonna state is uh, in the setting of the doubling map. So that's kind of an example because we, it applies much more generally to many more interval maps, but it's kind of easier to state for the doubling map. So I'll state it in that setting. So, um, okay, let me write theorem. So myself, Kunde, and Pearson. So we're looking at the transformation Tx equal to 2x mod 1. So it's a transformation from 0, 1 to 0, 1. And it has a natural invariant measure, which is just the Lebesgue measure. So you've probably all seen this at some point. The picture of the map looks something like this. And from this map, we are able to prove the following if we assume that our targets are balls with a fixed center y and radius rm. So it's one dimensional, so a ball is, of course, here just an interval with a fixed center. Then we have that the measure of the balls is less than c divided by m 
for any positive C, then we get uh, measure zero. And in the other direction, we prove that if the measure of the balls is greater than C log M squared divided by M, and this is for some C sufficiently large, then we get measure one. Okay. And then we have a specific result in the case where these targets is the interval with left endpoint zero and right endpoint two to the minus m times s. In this case, we compute that the packing dimension of the set is equal to one minus s for s in zero one and if s is larger than 1, we don't just get dimension 0. We sh can see that the set is countable. Okay. So a couple of remarks here. So probably the first question is, what the hell is the packing dimension? Okay, so... Um, and why would you compute it? Okay, so the reason why we computed the packing dimension was actually because we spent a long time proving what the Hausdorff dimension was, and the day we uh, finished, the day after, we found this paper by Bijon Liao, um, and then we thought, okay, now we understood this whole machinery, so let's try and squeeze something else out of it. Um, so we figured out we could compute the packing dimension. What's the packing dimension? So that's the first remark. Okay, so the, the definition is a little bit technical, and I'm not sure how interesting it is, but I can tell you that in terms of sort of hierarchy of dimension concepts, it's squeezed between the Hausdorff dimension and the upper box counting dimension. So I'm not going to say too much about this. I just want to say, so, okay, so if you have, most of you probably know the Hausdorff dimension, which comes from the Hausdorff measure. Um, there's the dimension, which is in some sense a much more crude, but much cute. But from a measure theoretic point of view, it's not very nice. There's no measure attached to the box counting dimension. And that causes weird things, like the box counting dimension of the rationals is one, whereas the Hausdorff dimension of the rationals is zero, which we would expect because it's a countable set. So fractal geometrists came up with a packed dimension, which is like from a measure theoretic point of view better. It gives measure zero to the rationals, but it's still easier to compute than the Hausdorff dimension. And what's a bit interesting is to speak, we get actually a different packing dimension than Hausdorff dimension, which maybe in some vague sense can be interpreted as that the set of eventually always hitting points in this range of speed of shrinking behaves differently at different scales. If we have something that is very self-similar, like the Cantor set, all these dimension concepts tend to agree. Whereas if we have something that scales differently at different uh, scales, so to say, then these dimensions are more likely to disagree. Okay, and that's all I'm going to say about the packing dimension. Uh, let me say a little bit something about the generality of this result. So um, the first result, A, uh, follows from, so A follows from something called hitting time statistics. I'm going to talk that, about that in a bit, so um, abbreviate HTS. And B follows from some exponential mixing estimates. So result A actually applies to really, really many uh, interval maps and all other systems. So many uniform expanding interval maps, uh, non-uniformly hyperbolic interval maps, Gauss map, some quadratic maps, and a lot of other systems. And the same with B. Uh, also works for some of the same systems. Okay, so it, <clears throat> this is sort of the public map, map is just an example. It actually applies much more generally. Um, but the two results on the dimension only apply to the uh, doubling map. I, the proof would also work. We didn't write it down actually, but for say k times x, where k is an integer, and I think we could also get it for beta transformations, but 
We thought we don't really know how many people, if any, care about the packing dimension. We weren't really willing to do the work. Okay, how much time do I have? Roughly. 15, okay. Sorry? Yes. Uh, no, you have more points than that. Uh, no, wait. Do you? No, so, no, actually, like, so you have in the sense that, you know, if you, if you, <coughs> if you write the points symbolically as sequences of zero and ones, it's essentially all, they can do all they want up to this M0 value. So there it can be anything, and then it has to be uh, zero, 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 zero after that. So I guess that is exactly pre-images of the, yeah, okay, yeah, so, true. Okay, um, so there's a couple of things that I would like to try and prove before the time is out. Okay, so actually one thing I wanted to do is to draw like a sketch of what the, for the doubling map, what the situation is of the eventually always hitting points versus the points that hit infinitely often. Okay, so now we know that one is a subset of the other, but we, it's kind of would be interesting to know how much of a, how big of a subset it is. So I'm gonna have a axis here from zero to one, and I'm gonna have a very unprecise axis here giving the speed, indicating the speed of convergence of the measures to zero. Okay, so we know from Brel Cantelli that we have a range here where the sum is divergent, and here a range where the sum is convergent. And if we consider the, the set of points that hit infinitely often, we know that that jumps from the measure jumps from one to zero here. And then, so that's a result I haven't mentioned, and I forget the reference, but there is a result that says the dimension, if I draw that as a dotted line, continues to be one for a while until we reach exponential speeds, so two to the minus ms, and then the dimension goes down towards zero as this is dimension Hausdorff dimension is one over one plus s. Um, so that's how this set of points that hit infinitely often looks. And now, what do we know from the set of eventually always hitting points for the doubling map? Well, okay, so the first Kelma result got us a little bit into the range of divergent sums here. So we know from here we have measure zero, and now with our result, we managed to push it up a little bit from one over m to c over m for any constant. So in terms of speed, that doesn't really make a difference, right? But when we started doing that, it wasn't, it wasn't clear whether this one over m might be some magic flip point where we go from zero uh, to one in measure. But so we can say now that we stay, stay at zero here, and then we have from the other direction this bound of c log m squared divided by m, where we know that we have measure one. So we still have you know, some kind of a gap here where we don't know where the measure jumps from, from one to zero. But we have an indication of like what, what we could hope to achieve through this Kleinbock and other result. That is, there's a tight range here, roughly at log log m divided by m, where we suspect we could maybe shrink in this, this range. And in terms of dimension, we know that from the Bijou-Liao result, that the dimension stays one exactly as long as for the points that hit infinitely often, after which it goes down to zero at u to the minus m, goes roughly like this. 
So this is this 1 minus s divided by 1 plus s squared. Um, and then it stays 0 after that. And then we have this sort of funny result that the packing dimension goes linearly down here. Okay, so this should give maybe a little bit of an idea of how these two sets <coughs> compare in size. So I think, especially in terms of dimension, it's kind of interesting that one never reaches dimension zero, whereas the other one very quickly goes just, not just to dimension zero, but becomes countable. Okay, so, did you say until three, or do we actually have until quarter past three? Was it one or? Yeah? Okay. Right. Um, let's see. So I wanted to prove a couple of things. So I wanted to prove this. result by Kelma also just because it gives a bit of an impression of how to work with this set. So his statement was that if the measure is less than C over M, C less than 1, we get measure 0. So how do we prove this? Okay, so it's a very easy proof. We prove the negation, so we prove that if the measure is 1, then implies the existence of a sequence Cm, which goes to 1, such that the measure of the Bms is larger than or equal to Cm divided by M. <clears throat> so measure of the set being equal to 1, from our definitions over here, so that's the same as, because of this nesting property, that's the same as saying that the measure of the ANs needs to go to 1. But measure of the ANs going to 1 means that measure of the CMs needs to go to 1, because AN is this intersection, so if the measure of these guys doesn't go to 1, the intersection surely won't go to 1. So the measure of the CM is something we can work with. So measure of CM is less than or equal to the sum of the measures of the t to the minus k bm from k equal to 0 up to m minus 1. Okay, but it's a measure preserving system, so we can just throw away the pre-images. And then we have here m times mu bm. This must go to, to 1. Okay, but that can only happen if we have such a sequence such that the measures are larger than cm over m. Okay, so that actually already proves this result. Um, so that's very easy to get. And then I want to try and explain how we can bump this bound up from 1 over m to n constant divided by m. Okay, so this is essentially theorem 1a. So this relies on this stuff called heating time, heating time statistics. Um, Actually, we saw on Monday in Partinel and Mahan's talk this stuff called extreme value theory that's very closely related to hitting time statistics. In many systems, when you have one, you get the other and vice versa. So this is about, um, so let me define, so to explain what this is about. So if we have a set E, we can define the first hitting time of X as the infimum n such that tnx lands in E. Okay, so that's just, we start at a point, we jump around, and then the first time we hit E, that's our first hitting time. So now there's an old lemma of uh, Kutch, Kutch's lemma, that says, so this uses also the assumption of ergodicity to say that what we expect this first hitting time to be is 1 divided by the measure of the set E. Okay, so it makes sense. If we're trying to hit a small set, we would expect 
to jump around a long time. If the set is large, it shouldn't take that long to hit it the first time. Okay, so now um, if we think of this in the shrinking target set, it's clear that the expected value of first hitting to Bm is equal to 1 over mu Bm, which goes to 0. So this goes to infinity. So now you can ask the question, how does this go to infinity in the distributional sense, right? So we expect this to go to infinity uh, So this is sort of the, the expected value, right? So this is how we expect it to go to infinity. But if we look at all points x, some might be ahead of the average and some might be behind the average. So we would like to understand, or some people are very interested in understanding, what is the measure on the set of x for which this hitting time to the m is less than or equal to the expected value of the random variable. So that's 1 over measure of em, but we want to be able to shift average a bit up and down to see how that affects the measure. So we throw in a real parameter tnr, and then we ask the question, what happens when we let m go to infinity? One question is, does this converge? And if it converges, does it converge too? Now this turns out to converge very often, and it converges to a type of exponential distribution. So it converges often to a function g of c, where g of c is of the form 1 minus e to the minus theta times c for some theta in 0, 1. Okay? But actually, what it converges to exactly, we don't really care about. What we care about is that this is less than 1 for all, well, this is what I care about. For This is less than 1 for all c in r. And the reason I care about this is that there's a very simple proof to proving the following. If we have, so I, this is called having exponential hitting time statistics. And we have, if we have exponential hitting time statistics, and the measures of my targets is less than c divided by m for any c, then this gives measure zero. Okay, so this is really a two-minute proof. So we're going to prove this by a contradiction. So we're going to assume that the measure is one and that the measure of the balls are less than, or the targets is less than C over M for any C. Okay, so we saw in the proof over here that measure of eventually always hitting being 1 is the same as that it converges to 1, which is the same as the measure of the CMs converges to 1. So we need the measure of the CMs to converge to 1, right, to avoid a contradiction. So, but what is CM? We can write CM as the points x in x, such that the orbit tkx from k equals 0 up to m minus 1 intersected with Bm is non-empty. But if, it, if we have hit the set Bm inside the first m minus 1, minus 1 orbit points, that's just exactly the same as the set of points x for which the first hitting time is less than m minus 1. Okay? Now this minus 1 is going to be a bit annoying, so I'll raise it and do an inclusion. And now I can rewrite this very simply to the set of x for which the first hitting time is less than c divided by c over m. Okay? 
And now if I replace C over M with something smaller, I get something bigger. So the inequality is easier to satisfy, so I get another inclusion. Okay. But this is exactly the set we were looking at when we were doing hitting time statistics. So if I know that I get exponential hitting time statistics, and I know in particular that the measure of this guy converges to something less than one, right? So if I take the measure here, and so on, I get the measure here. This converges to one minus e to the minus theta c, strictly less than one. And that contradicts that we needed to get this to go to one. So we have a contradiction. The measure is not one, because t is ergodic, when it's not one, it has to be zero. Okay, and then I think my time is essentially out, so I will skip talking about the proof of the uh, this here. But uh, essentially, this is a very classical application of exponential mixing. And when you apply, so it's exp exponential mixing with respect to L1 norms against bounded variation norms, which you know for many interval maps. And it's really a classical application of this, gives you exactly this, this bound. All right, thank you very much. Sorry? Yes. Yes, that I can write down very quickly. So, because these results are applicable to many different maps, you can also, this theorem for the A and B st statements, you can get for the Gauss map, right? So I'm just gonna write that down, but you, you could write exactly the same theorem A and B for the Gauss map. So if you then focus on the targets BM being uh, the interval with n point zero and radius rm, and then you use a connection between Gauss map and continued fractions, right? So we know that if we have a point x in 0, 1, then we can write x as 1 over a1 plus 1 over a2, and so on, right? And these continued fraction digits are generated as, so a1 of x is 1 over x minus the fractional part, and a j of x is equal to a1 of t j uh, minus 1 of x, where t of x is the Gauss map 1 over x uh, mod 1. And so essentially, if you use this connection, that means that if the Gauss map hits very close to 0, the next continued fraction digit is going to be very large. Use that connection, you can prove the following. So it's really not much more than a rewriting of this statement before, but it says that, uh, let's see, for c bigger than zero, uh, we have that the measure of the set of points x in zero one, for which there exists an m zero, such that for all m larger than m0, the maximal digit from 1 uh, k up to, do we have m? Being larger than c times m. Can you still see this? So this has measure 0. And you can get the so b, so for some constant c sufficiently small, you get same statement, but less than m divided by cm divided by log m squared 
is equal to 1. Okay? So you can really translate in this into a statement about, so in some sense you can say we look at numbers and we look at continued fractions expansion, and if we demand that at all times there's one that is larger than c times m, that happens with probability only zero, whereas if we only require to, uh, wait, have I turned things upside down? Um, no, it makes sense. If we say less than something like this, this is satisfied surely. Yes. So, uh, the first appearance of this uh, problem was basically by Tinchlan. Because he considered the rational rotations to show that the, the zero is the, in the almost, eventually almost heating set. All strictly quadratic. Okay. Uh. Yeah, you'll have to explain me, because we're actually looking at uh, also this for circle rotations. Uh, well, so he showed at one point that the eventual walls accept, but only for the walls uh, of exactly radius 1 or right square. Yeah, okay, all and, right. In fact, it's... Yeah, yeah okay, mm, that if makes you, sense. If you change the one, then for those walls. Yeah, okay, sure. Okay, good point.